All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Eric V. Stax. He's a cannabis farmer in Northern California who once owned and operated one of the first licensed cannabis farms in that state. He's an avid Bitcoiner and believes that Bitcoin has changed the fabric of our reality. He started making daily videos on X because he's passionate about Bitcoin and wants to share the profound effects of this technology with others. One of his quotes reads, and I, and, and I go, but let, let me know what you, uh, <laughs> if you have anything to add, Eric. The metaphysical yeah, yeah. nature of Bitcoin is ascending humanity to a higher state of consciousness and helping us heal our mass inherited ancestral trauma. Well, if you say stuff like that, man, I, I just wanted to talk to you. So I'm super happy that you're here yes. and excited to, uh, to talk with you, man. So welcome. Yes, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm super, super grateful, man. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's what triggered me in your videos. I love there's the first video I saw of you was I think you got out of your truck, you're outside of the farm, you're talking about Bitcoin, you're pointing your camera at the sun and you just say like, I'm super fucking grateful, man. I, I was yeah. like, Damn, I, I, I fuck with this guy. <laughs> like, that's yeah. great. Like I, you, you said it like you actually meant it, right? And that's what I think uh, I really saw. Yeah, well, it's true. I've said, you know, I say this because it's true. I feel like in some sense, I'm bursting at the seams. I'm so pumped. You know, we play the gratitude exercise and generally speaking, especially in the world we live in today with YouTube and a lot more of the spiritual metaphysical nature being brought to light by individuals like Joe Dispenza. We understand how important it is to think positive thoughts. And yes. For me, going down that path and trying to grapple with whatever traumatic experiences we, you know, experience in life and make sense of the world around me, into, uh, implementing that gratitude practice has been quite transformative. And after spending the last five years grappling with Bitcoin, I have just become progressively more and more hopeful and grateful because of the fundamental change that I believe in our reality as as a result of bitcoin the metaphysical nature of bitcoin the just the incentive inversion how it rewards the productive class you know what comes to mind is the sailor speaks yeah. to essentially and this is my words but history is laden with people who have been killed and and lied to and poisoned and had their shit taken from them and so in this sense you're at this game theoretic disadvantage in the marketplace because of the physicality of property uh, against the sociopaths who are willing to do whatever to get the most. So the path of least resistance to acquire something is to take it. Well, now because of the metaphysical nature of Bitcoin, you can custody your life force in this magical metaphysical thing that nobody can get from you even if they kill you. So yeah. now that trans, that, I mean, that just brings in like the most hope ever. Not even it, like the more I think about it too, I don't think it's not even it's so probable that Bitcoin does what the hardcore Bitcoin maximalists believe it's going to do, that that is the that is the most exciting thing. And in a sense, like this is the best time to ever be alive and to witness yeah. this and participate in this and have a piece of it. Dude, I can't even I don't have words to even describe how the level of gratitude like it's such a special experience. I'm yeah, I'm like, yeah, overwhelmed. Yeah. A few things yeah, to ahead. unpack there, like wh what I like, and, and that's what I really liked about your videos, is the fact that you can go to, to where you just went very quick, right? This zooming out to this bigger perspective where, and I think you definitely helped me with this, right? Also, like sometimes when you think about Bitcoin, you end up in a place where you think like, really? Like, could it really be this thing, yeah. right? And What's so nice is that when you hear other people come to the same conclusion through whatever their own way was, right? You know that you are not alone, one, and that totally. your, your, your rationale made sense, right? And that yes. you're, well, in, in, in essence, not cr uh, crazy thinking, right? Um, totally. Because that probability to both be crazy and end up in the same place is, is I think, pretty pretty low and also to go back to the that metaphysical part there's a I, I've, I've drafted this idea of an, an article i want to write and, and you just touched upon that like the, the people that were exploited in the past they were not aware of basically how 
the metaphysical nature of the nature basically works, right? So we have this encoding, we have an energy. When we point that energy towards something, it manifests in the, you know, meat space or, or real uh, world. But I think there's two things going on, right? Like one, we are not aware of what this encoding in us is in, in general, you know, people in the past, ancient civilizations, etc. like they knew, we, we, we don't. And I, I, I think a lot of people are actually learning about this currently more, like you feel that energy shift, I'd say. But also because people are not aware of that, but also the like functional base layer of how we interact with each other, right? The money is broken. People can like, there's two things converging together and that's why people can be um, exploited. And how you just explained your view on Bitcoin, I want to explain kind of like this, where if Bitcoin exists in the world and creates the code for a almost perfected truth, right? Engineered truth in a base, encoded in a base layer. And then on top of that, um, we can project our energy to build stuff or think about things and project our energy you know, on top of this layer. And then we can create new stuff, right? So again, we go from like a coded base layer to directed energy to realization of whatever physical things totally. there are, right? And I love that you just said that because this is one of the things I want to write about. It's so Bitcoin touches on these things. And I know that maybe for some people who are listening now are like, okay, where did these guys just end up in five minutes? But this is also for me, this signal that Bitcoin is really fucking huge. Like this, it's it's not the, just the technology, it's the moment in time, it's the the problem it's solving, it's everything like the timing is right also and that is also very um yeah, very special so i just want to to give that reflection because i am somewhere in the same realm i think of uh, yeah of it's thoughts. the same thought thread with slightly thought thread with slightly different words but yeah i totally agree yeah um so the first question i actually wanted to ask you and maybe the yeah. answer is very, very simple how does a guy growing weed in northern california get introduced to bitcoin <laughs> Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got into Northern, I came to Northern California from Southern California, where I grew up. Uh, in 2009, I was 25 years old. And a friend that I went to high school with moved up here to go to Humboldt State University, uh, started getting involved in the cannabis industry, because it was a big, huge growing market taking place here in Humboldt County. You know, the, tri uh, the Emerald Triangle, the three counties up here where most of yeah, the that's cannabis Northern, production yeah. Yeah, it's taking place, you know, Trinity, Humboldt, uh, and Mendocino County. And so my friend invited me to come up and trim. And I did. I left my life in Southern California. And I knew immediately when I, when I drove in through the forest. I hadn't even, like, landed entirely in Humboldt. And I knew that evening driving into the area, like, this is, this is my future. I'm going to get involved in cannabis. I'm going to produce cannabis. I wanted to be a part of it. I had an affinity from cannabis from it for cannabis from a young age. And I think that that stemmed from the ph pharmaceutical use that I was exposed to in my family growing up. Uh, I had two PhD parents. One's a sociologist, my mother, and my stepfather was a prescribing psychiatrist. So I got to wow. really witness a lot of the side effects and downfalls, pitfalls, if you will, of the pharmaceutical industry and developed a mistrust at a very young age for essentially our entire, entire societal construct um, and developed an affinity for cannabis in my, my mid-teens. Uh, so for me, I really found like, felt like I found my calling uh, when I came, in, came up to Humboldt County. And I've been here, so, I don't know, 15 years now. And as a cannabis producer, uh, I was predisposed in a lot of ways to understand commoditization, understand supply and demand. And in 2017, at the time I owned a property that I was in the process of getting permitted, and I actually just gotten the property permitted by Humboldt County. I was one of the first people, like the 35th or the 40th permit or something to get signed, full final approval from the county for cannabis cultivation. And I was awaiting approval from the state of California and this was December of 2017, where I was exposed like for real to Bitcoin and had like the real conversation about it. Like, hey, here's this thing that's truly decentralized in this format. And there's these there's a supply cap. And because of that predisposition from my experience 
being a cannabis producer. Um, and at that time I just bought my first property and I had previously spent like the last, the prior 12 months or the previous 12 months, uh, really digging into understanding monetary policy, the federal reserve and the mortgages and the boom bust cycles. Cause now I had a heavy incentive to understand that of standing on, yeah. you know, a 17 acre parcel with 2,600 square foot house. And I'm in the process of getting this thing approved by the, the state for a cannabis facility, similar to this. So. Yeah, that was when I was introduced to Bitcoin and it immediately made sense. And, and, and actually, it was one of the things that I would say was the biggest catalyst for me to pivot my business model and sell the, the farm because I had a lot. There was a lot of regulatory uncertainty. There was an enormous mm -hmm. amount of counterparty risk, the volatility within the cannabis industry. Um, yeah, I basically realized that my dream come true was something that I needed to change. And so as a result, at the end of the second year of owning it, after getting it approved, fully licensed, I sold it. And then I started to take on my Bitcoin position. And since then, the more that I've learned, you know, I listened to uh, Jeff Booth, maybe nine, 12 months ago, somebody was interviewing them and they asked him about his, his allocation to Bitcoin. And I loved his answer. He essentially said, the more he's determined that it's unprobable, the higher the probability of success and his, his evolving determination of that success, the higher his percentage allocation has become. And so that's kind of what I went through as well. And so over the last many years, I've just got converted everything that I was holding holding on to that had any monetary energy in it into Bitcoin and at times did so sweating bullets with the understanding that like I could wake up tomorrow and this thing could be a lot more money. And so, yeah, and it's been very transformative for me um, just in in all and so in most of the ways. Actually, yeah. I would be hard. I'd have to play a game of like, I wonder how what areas of my life Bitcoin hasn't touched would be <laughs> would be the exercise. Yeah, yeah. I have a Anyways, similar experience, I think. Yeah. yeah. So how how do you connect then like uh, your experience and, and interest in, in cannabis and trying to establish that yourself to Bitcoin? Is that then, um, and this is kind of my, uh, um, I'm projecting here a bit, right? But like my view on cannabis is this is a plant. This is a nature given given by, <laughs> by nature. Um, and if we go back to like the structural code of the nature, in some way it helps us the humans because it connects with us um yeah to view the world that uh, we live in or our thoughts you know internal external however you want to define that right uh in in a different way so i'm a i'm a big cannabis um proponent in a sense yeah it's just a plant right but i can imagine that if if, if you have a regular thought about uh, or a similar thought about that 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 when you think like, okay, I want to grow this, you have to go to this person, that person, that state, uh, you have to wait for those approvals. Like, am I, am I walking in the right direction in a sense? Like, is that where you can like see what the power of the government is over what is basically a, a, a plant, right? Yeah. So there's a handful of threads that I could pull on there and I guess we'll just run through them, try to distill them down, but keep them comprehensive. Uh, I believe there's a lot of parallels between Bitcoin and cannabis in the sense of I feel like you have this game of whack-a-mole where if you try to oppress something that the market wants, it's going to figure out how to pop up and show up somewhere else. And so yep. and I would say also that the prohibition of cannabis has been alignment with the progressive uh, change in the reserve standard and the debasement of our currency over the last 100 years. And so there's a lot of parallels there. Um, I also think that there's an ethos between cannabis, which kind of goes back to that whack-a-mole uh, uh, analogy of, fuck you, we're going to do what's right. You know, what we <laughs> think to be right, even if it's hard and we have to pay a price to do so. You know, another thing a sailor says is, you know, history is full of people who were willing to die for what they believed in. And so over the last however long, since the 30s, since prohibition really took place, like millions and millions of Americans said, hey, you know what, we're going to consume, we're going to produce, and we're going to sell this, this, this plant. I also think that there is, was a need in some sense to suppress things that have the effects that cannabis do on consciousness. And that's a whole large conversation. Yeah. But if I were going to distill it down to the most basics, the best way that I could put that is, is I believe cannabis has this ability to accentuate 
your thought process. That high feeling, I think, is an enhancement that we get of our senses. And I yes. think it has a calibrating modulatory effect. And I think it, it, it almost like in some sense calibrates your empathy region within you. And I, and I, you could say that when like, and for me, if I go long periods of time without ingesting cannabis in any form, and I do, I, you get hit with that wave people speak to of like paranoia where it's kind of like, oh, did I say that thing? Like I was a little harsh. I was a little rude. Like I've been behaving too hubristically. I, you know, and I, mm. ah, I shouldn't have done that thing. I was kind of hard on that person or, Hey, you know, I snapped yeah. at my wife. I kind of feel bad. And so I think that the suppression of cannabis was a requirement in some sense and the promotion of like the, well, dude, there's so many parallels, like the degradation of our society, the promotion of like the intoxication from pharmaceuticals and alcohol, and then the ban on mind altering substances, because they're all mind altering, caffeine, cannabis, LSD, psilocybin, alcohol, pharmaceuticals, SSRIs, barbiturates, whatever. You can put all of these products, tobacco, they all really fall as far as I'm concerned into the same bucket. And if you look at which ones are banned, they're the ones that expand your ability to see in multiple layers what is taking place in our reality. They're enhancers, yep. in my humble opinion. And so, yeah, that, there's yeah, there's a lot there. I kind of there was a third thought that I wanted to tie into that, but. I lost my train there. Yeah, yeah. All good. Yeah, I, I love what you said about it. it brings you, I think, more in alignment of like the true energy that is inside you, right? Like the um, the the your your you can free yourself a bit from the from the programming that everyone is, I think, a sub a subject to, right? And of course, that is not what. Uh, the government wants it's really interesting i have a big book on cannabis here which is about also like uh, dutch history on cannabis and just uh i watched also a documentary about the history uh, in america right and it's it's interesting that why there was a prohibition were all these like very uh gnarly <laughs> incentives and quotes i think um you know about why why they banned it but there's never a real argument against it and that is it's just a bunch kind of, of like where Yep, basically right yeah. like like well well so yeah two things so what you just said like if you know truly know that this is uh you think this is a good thing uh you know where there's no hubris but there is a lot of humility and you know that this could have a positive effect on people then you want to promote it then you want to use it then you want to uh, grow it basically right and i feel it's the same as with bitcoin eventually you know, sometimes I see people say about Bitcoin, there are no informed critiques, right? And it always sounds very, like, full of hubris, right? When someone totally. says that. Yes. But it's actually true because the only... Um, well, it's the most probabilistic is what I would say. All, also, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, a good yeah. One too. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the, one, the arguments you see against Bitcoin, they are actually full of hubris. I have a totally. PhD, you know, like I had a guy yeah. yesterday on Twitter who like listed all of his experience in finance to substantiate his argument that Bitcoin was a Ponzi after I said, if you say Bitcoin is a Ponzi, you disqualify yourself. Yeah. And so it's... He showed you what software and what programming he's running. He's like, yo, I'm running all these Keynesian programs and this is my yeah, flex exactly. on you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no updates received, right? Yeah, yeah but I totally. Think... <laughs> <laughs> but that alignment... I think is interesting. I, I perhaps there's more subjects like that, right? But once you really understand, you know, I, I think it goes even further back, like a first principle that you are not better than another human or something, right? Like so, yeah, yeah. If, if other humans ro rule over you, but but they don't know anything about the subject that you know everything about, and you can honestly, without hubris, with all your humility, say this is not a bad thing. And then someone else who's not better than you does say it's a bad thing. And actually, because they have power, they will not give you a license, right? Or not give you permission to own something or, or do something. Yeah, I think that is where some people take the red pill in a sense, where you realize, hey, there's no rationale here. Like this person is totally. just, um, like, uh, you know, uh, applying their power over me, basically. Yep. And that's when, totally. when you know... 
you're right, actually. When someone else says you're wrong without substance, you know you're right, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I, lo I love that. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good comparison, I think. So recently you started making videos on yep. X, like what is, you know, sharing your thoughts and enthusiasm about Bitcoin. Like what's the, what's the motivation behind that? Uh, well, it's multifaceted. Uh, I would say that the first thing is, is that I just wanted to expand my conversational reach. I wanted to connect with other like-minded individuals. Uh, I wasn't actually didn't think it was going to be as effective as it has been. Uh, I learned all up until I think, a, I don't know, a little bit before Thanksgiving, maybe August, September. I got onto Twitter, started to try to figure out how to tap into the Twitter community and look at what was happening there pertains to, to Bitcoin Twitter. Um, but really, as far as content and, and education, what I've been what I've learned from is, is listening to all of the podcasts and interviews on YouTube and then listening to audiobooks. And so for me in Northern California, you know, I, I feel like I spend my life just talking to the same 15 people all day long about all of these profound Bitcoin, you know, ideas that I'm grappling with. Uh, and I really just wanted to expand my conversational reach first off. And then secondly, cool. I feel like we at scale are manifesting a collective reality like you and this is the way i think about in term in life like you live your own reality and there's a lot of things that are very subjective uh to you and and i'm living my own individual reality but we're coming in we're meeting in this collective reality mm. and i feel like you know there's a lot of dialogue around how does this go and i feel like it's still up in the air is this this do we have hyper Bitcoinization and the Trojan horse of freedom made it into the castle? And now do the, do the, do the entities inside of that Trojan horse, do they jump out and everyone just celebrates and lives abundance and has this big party or is there like a bloody feud? And I actually don't think we're in for a bloody feud. And I think that a lot of people and heavy, heavy Bitcoiners think that we're in for potential civil, civil war and revolution. And I just think because of the fundamental inversion and the incentive structure and the physicality of property, that if the sociopathic overlording people who are incentivized to do things that are not good for us and not good for our planet, planet given our fiat paradigm, which just evolved from, I think that was the best solution to a reality where every, everything was physical. And now that we have this metaphysical property, the inversion in, in the inversion in the incentives means that if you're a sociopathic leader, it's actually you don't even need to do things that fuck the world up to get the most. You do the right thing to get the most. And I actually yeah. think that if you're a sociopath who's willing to do the wrong thing to kill and steal and to acquire the most energy, I would argue that most of them don't get their jollies off doing it that they would actually still prefer to do the right thing to get the most. And now because of the metaphysical nature and the inviolability of pro uh, property of Bitcoin, the way to get it is just to negotiate with the people. And I also think that, you know, a sailor, I heard sailors say this, you know, if you have a ruling class and you have a bunch of people who don't have any power, they look at you with contempt. Well, if they have power, you're looked at with respect. And I really like that. And so I do think that we're not in for some nasty transition, but I also feel like it's all probabilistic because this hasn't happened yet. And, and I think mm. in terms of, you know, Bashar or Abraham Hicks and the law of attraction or the work that Joe Dispenza is doing and the quantum physicists in the world and the double slit experiment. And so I would get, because I don't know anything, I'm open to everything. And that seems to have the most probable explanation as far as I could tell. We live in this simulated reality, and I think it's probabilistic that it's a simulation. And I think that as a result, we have an opportunity to create whatever outcome we want, but it requires mm. focus and attention. And so I yes. wanted to share my thoughts at, at more scale than I was to attempt, even if it's in the most infinitesimal manner, to help affect the future outcome. I want to pull that reality out of the quantum field. It's the observer who at least changes the wave into a particle. And so I want to throw that and I want to fuel that. I want to feel that. I want to integrate that vision for a future 
I want to put focus on that one to help balance out some of the fear that we have. And the fear, I think, stems from like it's hardwired programming. It's like inherited ancestral trauma from the just foreverness of the physicality of property and the game theoretic fuckness and the reality that we live in. And so I, I refer to that as looking at the new world through the lens of the old world. And if yeah. you do so, then what you see is this very tumultuous future. But I think the fabric of our reality is fundamentally different now. And as a mm. result, I think that the future is probabilistically going to be quite beautiful. And I think we're going to usher it in at an unfathomable rate. And I just want to shed light on that. I want to put the orange spotlight on that one because... And, and and maybe to a certain degree, you could say maybe I'm just self-deluded and I have a cognitive bias and thinking that way makes me feel better. But if I think that way and I feel better, then my, my reality becomes better. And then am I creating that reality for myself? It's like well, you're actually doing it. It's it's uh, uh, I hear a few things here, right? It's walking the talk. It's doing the work, right? It's actually the projection of the energy in your mind to a broader reality than just your personal um, experience, I'd say, right? So you're basically practicing what I also see as the laws of the universe, right? And how energy flows uh, towards creating uh, energy and attention towards creating something. So I think you're walking the talk of your beliefs in a sense. Well, I appreciate that. At least that. an attempt. I... At least an attempt, an attempt, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the yeah. one thing that I know I can do. I know that I can, I know that I can put forth the effort. What comes of that, the, the, I don't know, but I know that I can make, take the action. Yeah. And I do think that in terms of the law of attraction is your reality, your vibrational frequency is being mirrored to you in, in the world around you. Yeah. And the more time I grapple oh, but that with works. Bitcoin, that works you, because you triggered me, right? I mean, yeah, that's just totally. one example. But I feel yeah. that that is that is what should illustrate it. Uh, that mm -hmm. what you put out, you will also receive. And I think, um, hopefully, I can help. Uh, you know, with a small uh, contribution to, you know, sharing your thoughts again further. Right. So I think that is exactly the mechanism that uh, that you just mentioned, and and how um, we can help each other. And that's what I personally really see in bitcoin this mutual benefit of adopting bitcoin that is actually just amazing right like the whole zero sum totally. game that existed before this will be gone at least you know that's the projection in the future i'd say but i think that is what you're talking about just a mutual benefit of adopting bitcoin for anyone at any level uh, at that doesn't really matter with any experience, age, whatever. Yeah. You know, that's the beauty of Bitcoin, I'd say. Yeah. You know, like Sailor says, it's the only ethic, it's the ethical investment. And I think that this is, you know, if you look at the new world from the lens of the new world, as I like those are words that I like to use, I like Jeff Booth, he speaks to it. You can't look at the new system through the lens of the old system. We're speaking to the yeah. same thing. Mm -hmm. You can't see, you can't, I, and I have just, debate after debate with intelligent individual who gets has this hang up point where they just yes. can't understand the 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 fact that it's you can't co-opt it and how no matter like in every way even so I, this is one of the things i say so every time someone buys bitcoin it's good for everybody who owns bitcoin and it's good for everybody who doesn't own bitcoin it's mm -hmm. good for everybody and people can't see that. You know, if I if I buy more Bitcoin and I don't buy a rental house, for example, to save my economic energy, that's downward price pressure on houses. And in a fiat paradigm, that's more of a liquidity crisis because you have debt, these houses back. But also like, <clears throat> and so that strengthens the Bitcoin. It makes houses more affordable for people who don't own homes, even if they don't own Bitcoin. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a, a big... A big hang up there. And but also if the ADIQ plebs can figure it out, everybody else will. It's just and I think that it's like the hundredth monkey thing. I you know, there's this I forget where I heard this. My wife speaks to this often. At, you know, there's this idea that after 144,000 people channel an idea, it like permeates with, through a culture at scale or at some hyper rate. 
Mm. And I think we're there. I think we're experiencing it. I think more and more people are waking up to this thing every single day. And it's the incentive, too. And the thing that's so beautiful, one of the many things that's so beautiful is just how the ethical investments, the ethical monetary network, it just the, the, fab, the new reality, if you will. It's like we discovered bedrock. It's a new world. We all just are going to go there now where there's <laughs> infinite abundance yeah. and freedom for everybody. Uh, oh, I lost it. That was a good one. I was deep. The monkeys. Oh, we'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll pull. I'll pull on, on okay, that. Okay. Okay. No, you were talking <laughs> yeah, about yeah, the yeah. monkeys, but 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 that's actually a fascinating number. I I. I'm I'm lately I've been getting into this a bit more like these thoughts about if how many people do we need to actually create a certain change, right? And I think. You just what did you just say? Hundred forty thousand something. Hundred forty four. Like, like that sounds minuscule and doable, <laughs> right? And yeah. I think that is so you could so say we're fascinating. Past the tipping point. Probably, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's happened, yeah. But that's so fascinating that uh, it's also I think a part of the like programming you have. Like, what is my influence? I don't have a lot of influence. I'm just me, right? But if you understand something like this then you know that a movement doesn't involve that that much right i think you just said off off mic before we started like if if you can have a big enough group that have like a common ground of understanding of a certain um yeah philosophy or future project projection and in this case you know a combination with a certain technology then that is already what connects us, right? And then it doesn't really matter if you're from Northern California and I'm from Western Europe and someone comes in from an Arab country or Australia. We already bonded on a foundational level. So we can skip that whole part, <laughs> basically, and yeah. move together. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that... I think that what you're speaking to is like, if you look at it through... You know, Tesla says, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you need to think in terms of energy, vibration and frequency. And I think that Bitcoin, because it's this mass truth protocol, it's it's essentially this fixed immovable object that we're yes. all tethering to and tethering our economic energy to. We're all thinking about the exact same thing. We're looking at the same list. It's the same addresses. It's the same 21 million coins. And it's at the largest it's at scale. It's it's all across the entire planet. I think for all of known history, we've organized ourselves around things in in a much or in in a less effective way by orders of magnitude. Even with religion, you could take any religion. the The stories were all slightly different. They're slightly different ideologies, but they're all kind of subscribing to the same idea of there's this. You, you need to be good to people. We come from a place. Mm. We go to a place. There's common themes. And so with Bitcoin, because of this mass consensual reality that we're all like moving into, we're tuning ourselves vibrationally and agreeing upon this thing. And it's connecting us at a level in which we have never connected before, uh, you know, at scale. Um, well, yeah, in an incorruptible base layer, it's basically. Yeah, that, right. Well, like, it's the like, mass agreeance. It's like there's exactly. It, yeah. so, so if I'm if I'm if I am hanging out with a group of individuals and we're talking about some some ideology and on the other side of the planet there's a group of individuals talking about a similar the same ideology but they're doing it with different gods for example you know like mm. you take the native americans versus like the roman empire for example we had they have these religious beliefs you could say these spiritual realms but they there was a mass distortion there or there was a, a huge divide in and that story and the specific details around those stories that they were using to interpret the world around them, causing them to individually and collectively vibrate at a different frequency. And so yes. I think Bitcoin is attuning us. It's calibrating us. It's uh, this is what I think I was going to say. It's aligning the, the 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 what is it? It's aligning the end the the best for the individual with what's best for the collective. And people can't really see that because it's the first time in human history. And so it's tuning us all. We're all we're all starting to ascend to a higher state of consciousness collectively, 
because we're tuning to the same frequency. And then if you layer in on top of that, that now you have metaphysical property and I'm now becoming every day more and more absolved from the trauma induced from the traumatic experiences that myself and all of my known as ancestors forever had to endure trying to protect themselves from plunder. And now we have a technology that allows you to insulate yourself from plunder and violence in a way that you've never been able to in all of known history. And it's absolving us of like mass stress and cortisol, allowing us to creating a feedback loop of I feel better and I'm less stressed. If I my physiology is feels better, I'm thinking better thoughts. Then in turn, I'm taking more action. My dopamine and my serotonin and all my things are firing and wired. I'm incentivized to do the hard thing that's right over the long term that's going to yield me the most. And that feedback loops takes place. And I think it's happening at mass scale, honestly. Um and that was what that is part of what I really want to shed light on and, and contribute to this movement, even if it's in the most minuscule ways, because I think that people are missing that. You know, I was listening to uh, uh, a Gabor Mate conversation. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gabor yeah. Mate, but he does a lot of work on trauma and addiction. He says that it's the traumatic experiences. So if you're traumatized, you experience something traumatizing, but the trauma takes place within you as a result of that traumatizing experience. And yes. we carry that forward. And I think at mass, Bitcoin is transmuting this trauma within us that we, I think, also pass on and inherit ancestrally due to the vibrational nature of our reality and like epigenetics you know and the ability for the genetic code to update itself so quickly in an environment where if you take an exact copy of a species and you put them into different environments like if i take a clone of these plants and i put one in a shitty environment and one in a really good environment i'm going to get a different physiological physiological response from those plants it's a different phenotypic expression and so if the genes can spit out such a different response to its environment that quickly that's an indicator to me that we really can upgrade and update our genetic code as we pass it on to our descendants. And I think that at like scale, the cellular, like our genetic code and on a cellular level, like pain, trauma and like toxicity is being transmuted. And I think it's happening at a fat, hyper rate. And I just, you know, I, I think that some people, are, some people are seeing that at this point. And I, you know, I want to participate in that conversation, you know, and, yeah. and, and also it's like you said, am I, am I tripping? Am I fucking nuts? Cause you know what? I could wake up tomorrow and everything that I ever thought to be true could be entirely wrong. You know, I have mm -hmm. to maintain that humility and just, this is my most probabilistic logical assessment, of the reality that I'm experiencing. Yeah. And so I just think, you know, honestly, it's the biggest deal in human history. If, <laughs> yeah. if, if this is all the case, oh, if this I is all it. like, if so, <laughs> then. Yeah. We live in a new world, you know, yeah. and I don't think it's going to be tumultuous, a, a tumultuous transition. You know, I don't think it's going to be some nasty thing. And is it then also, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I fully agree. I love, this is also what I was aiming for with this conversation, like this zooming out, like what is this bigger picture that is taking yeah. place? And I also had, you know, I saw you in one of your videos, you said like Satoshi fixed our reality. That is basically what you just illustrated right because that new this is my trend the translation because this new um reality of the, this new base layer of truth is actually there we who are basically operating on top of that base layer of truth at least between each other right to together build new things realize new movements or whatever do things together as humans we also get the freedom to actually work on these traumatic experiences right and or work through them or as you said like transmute them and lose them actually so that the generation that comes after us which will also live on this truth-based layer will have less of that and that eventually will be good for the entirety of humanity because then there, it is no zero sum game anymore. It's it's back to a together game, basically a mutual beneficial relationship between any human, wherever they live. Basically, that's kind of my translation here. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. 
Yeah, so I think in what's, terms of yeah. it's like it's calibrating us. You know, the county has to come through it from yeah, exactly. the ag department. It grounds and us. They, it grounds us. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the county comes through with uh once a year and they, you know, they have a little box with these weights and they put on white gloves and they calibrate our scales so that when we're selling, you know, certain volumes for certain weights of our products that the scale is actually reading right. And so in some sense for all of known history, we've all been out of calibration or struggling to calibrate. Mm. Yeah. And so when you know, you talked about your involvement in cannabis, how you how you viewed that, then you found Bitcoin. Like, uh, I know you love Jeff Booth. You listen a lot to him as well. Like, what what kinds of first principles influence your thinking about Bitcoin and like the topics it touches? Like, are there any things that that you like to follow that help you in your thinking? Totally. And I would say on that note, Jeff Booth's work was absolutely pivotal and important for me in my life and my understanding, the evolution of my understanding of what, of the forces in, that are taking place in the world around me. And when with the price of tomorrow and his, you know, uh, shedding such beautiful light on the deflationary forces of our reality, that helped me really put words to and understand what I've experienced as a cannabis producer, which is a commodity and that yeah. supply is always meeting demand. And in, in the process of commoditization, if you have a large profit, you have a large incentive for capital and entrepreneurs to flow into that sector of the marketplace and up the supply relative to the demand driving down the value, you know, and, and Booth said, this is the first person I'd said, heard say that the price of everything drops to its marginal cost of production. And so I have two things that are three things that are working against me as a cannabis producer. You know, it's like Sailor said, we have an existential crisis. He had $500 million on the balance sheet. It was a melting ice cube. He's got this company that the debasement's taking place. If his cash flows aren't increasing as fast as the debasement or the real inflation rate, he's getting a haircut. And, and so all that really helped me to understand that I have commoditization, the force of commoditization supplied to meeting, meeting demand, dropping the price of the, the, the product that I produce. Then I have jurisdictional competition. You know, for example, California has high taxes, there's high fees. And as a business producer in California, I have a high cost. The energy costs in Northern California per kilowatt hour, I think I, I want to say it's like 15 cents, an average 20 cents, an average per kilowatt hour used to run this facility. And in Oklahoma, it's a lot easier to get permitted or licensed and approved and the cost of living is less and the taxes are less and the energy is less. So I'm at a market disadvantage because of yep. jurisdictional competition. And a layer on top of that, the third force that's making our lives hard, and we all have certain flavors of this, depending on where we reside in the marketplace, but that's the monetary inflation coupled with the deflationary rate the reality of our world. And so my cost of living is going up denominated in dollars and my co the cost of the commodity that I produce is going down denominated in dollars. So I, I have real, real numerical wage deflation mm. and real cost of living inflation. So it's like the most extreme problem to have somebody who is minimum wage. If their cost of living goes up 15% or something over a two year period on average, but their wages go up 5%, they have the optical illusion of making money, but the cost of living is moving up faster. But that's, that's real wage deflation, even if it's not dollar denominated wage deflation. So I have an extreme situation here further incentivizing me to kind of do essentially what Sailor did is, is that any of my treasury reserve, any of my surplus, my monetary energy that I have any other assets, obviously needs to go into Bitcoin for all the obvious reasons. But in addition to that, everything that I can spin off as a surplus also has to go into Bitcoin. And now here's the cool part. Those forces, all three of them, as a matter of fact, commoditization, jurisdictional competition, uh, uh, and regulatory, yeah, regulatory competition. What is drawing a blank here? Excuse me. Those forces, though, make my Bitcoin more valuable. You know, <laughs> so for yeah. me, it's the hedge against these forces that are fucking making my life fucked. If that makes sense. 
So heavily predisposed to adopting a Bitcoin standard, that and being somebody who's, interestingly enough, not a huge risk taker, I find it to also be the safest place to have my economic surplus due to debasement yeah. and confiscation and et cetera. It's fascinating. I tweeted this yeah. before, like I am a control freak and not a risk taker. My risk profile is very low. Yeah. And that's yes. exactly why I Bitcoin, right? I want to I wanna talk more about this in general, actually, to... I'm not sure yet how to help people understand, but this is exactly, exactly why I Bitcoin. Uh, the fact that I don't want to take that other risk of mitigating the debasement. And, you know, um, I, I love having the example of when you have a job or a venture, you take risk, you know, in spending your money or, or like energy, time, uh, energy and time to earn energy back. But yeah, if uh, if it's deflated on purpose, then when you're home, you have another cho a job that you didn't know you have before, and then you have to, you know, take totally. more take more risk and stuff. Like I don't I don't want to do that. So it's also actually, in a sense, a pretty lazy thing, right? Like it I is. just say save in Bitcoin. I sit on my hands. Literally, it's not rocket science. It. it it's hard to actually get to that point. Like I totally understand that, right? Like you have to have, you know, get, you know, there has to be a certain path created for you or perhaps what you just shared, right? Okay. I am in an industry I love. I want to stay here. This place is great, but wow. Uh, my, my costs are going up and my revenue is going down. I have a serious problem, right? For whereas yeah. I always say my, my own example, sometimes, not to pat myself on the chest, but I never really experienced the problem and I still figured it out. Like, that's really hard, actually. Yeah, right? Like, totally. I, I don't know what my path exactly was, but it was more like a spiritual thing, almost like, okay, I never had a problem, I, but I'm still participating in a system that I have no clue about, like, how this works. Okay, I need to dive into this, right? And then slowly getting to to grasp, like, the irrationality and, and how illogical you know, this whole uh, system is that we are basically all forced to participate in, right? And so it's yeah. interesting that everyone has their own path to the same conclusion. And when you end up at that conclusion, what you have to do is very, very, very simple, right? You save yep. in this new system, all the excess energy in, in forms of money that you have, you just put into the system and you do nothing. You don't have to totally. do anything. You don't have to mitigate yep. risk. You don't have to take more risk, like all these things. So it's interesting that also back to, um, I'd say, you know, like you have to be uncomfortable in a big way first to then have the easy life, right? It's hard choices, totally. easy life, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and that's also for me, again, like a fun realization or so interesting about Bitcoin that it even aligns with all those bigger principles, right? Like these bigger kind of like life quotes sometimes that you hear where totally. you think like, this is my entire experience with Bitcoin and it yeah, fully it aligns with this, with this reality basically, right? And yep. I, I want to link to like another, uh, like an epic rant you had uh, that, I, that I saw on Twitter. You said... I think we should all be rational and sell everything we don't need and buy Bitcoin, which of course sounds ridiculous if you don't totally, if you're not yeah. if you're not at the same point. Yeah. But when you are at that point, you totally understand what you are saying, right? Like I mean, I have like, I don't know, 10, 20 pairs of sneakers. Uh, and sometimes I see sneakers and I think like, oh, I want those sneakers. No, fuck no, I don't want those sneakers. Like I'm totally. selling I'm selling stuff left and right. To yeah. just stack stack more Bitcoin, and I'm also not consuming anymore, um, like I previously did, you know, in in whatever way. And so, what like I wanted to get back to that rant, like, what what is your your background or your um, how do you say like your explainer there? Like, if you're rational, you should sell everything you own for Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh... Well, I think due to the fact that it's the first thermodynamically sound monetary instrument, amongst many other things, but that means that the way to get the most, I think, in, you know, it's energy in, energy out. The way to get the most is now the easy thing, which is just a DCA into this one asset. You know, it's like uh, 
Sailor when you know Sailor is talking to to Bill you and he's like, Yeah, are you, you all know, in on the chair? Are you all in on the chair? Like you, you use rubber band knives, you know? <laughs> and so it made sense to allocate levels of energy to figuring out the the markets and have a diversified portfolio and to play that game because you had different flavors of risk and different different reward profiles and every market's gonna be slightly different. But now with Bitcoin. The game is simple. The simple way to get the most, to, see, this is where it's so fun. It's so beautiful. The way to get the most is now the easiest thing. Yes. And <laughs> that's why so it's beautiful. so hard to grasp. And people are just, even Ray Dalio is like, he's like, mm, I don't know. Apparently no. the, the the idea is, is that Ray Dalio thinks it's too good to be true. Uh, and maybe he's right. I don't know. It's all probabilistic. Uh, yeah, but the oh, easy but that's thing the is the entirety now... of life is probabilistic, it is. right? But 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 uh, sorry to interrupt, but like the no, it's good. What you said about thermodynamically sound, that's like also one of my biggest things. I see it. It's a see it as a three D cube in cyberspace where physical yep. energy through mining was put in this physical cube, and because it's thermo, uh, sorry, I've lost the word thermodynamically sound. That yeah. energy, that physical energy will never leave the little, you know, 3D cube. Totally. There's 21 million of these 3D cubes and that's it. That, that's yep. literally it, right? And now you have like coins and little, uh, little bills where energy is stored in, but that leaks left and right. And that's... I, this is the simplest I can I think it's the explain. First it. battery that really works in all of exactly. known his, human history. So you have to move your energy from you know whatever you think is money right now and move yep. it into these you know digital cubes yeah. where you know physical energy was put in. That's it. Totally. I don't know. Yeah, I and it takes, takes sense. A, it takes oh, it totally <laughs> does. It takes a lot of work to get there though. It, it really does. Course, you have to yeah. you have to really grapple with it all because you know it's just it's 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 a paradigm shift. It's a new world. It's a whole new thing. Gosh, it solves so many problems and it makes things so so many things so clear. And I think also a very profound effect amongst amongst the people in the Bitcoin community who you can say have made it to the place where they live entirely on a Bitcoin standard or at the very least understand it a Bitcoin standard. And most most of its entirety, uh, there you free up so much cognitive function, so much mental RAM that now yes. like you're thinking about deeper thoughts. You're yes. you can channel that energy more into what it is that you love to do. It's just like you said, if you can live a life and spin off a surplus, but then you have to go home and figure out how to be. A fund manager. Yeah, you're a slave. A you're you're hijacked. Too, Your mental yeah, it, energy is you're, hijacked. But you're a, yeah. you're a squirrel in the in the in the woods who's a slave to just trying to protect their nuts forever, and mm -hmm. like they're just rotting. And you have to go yeah. get more. And people are stealing. And you don't them, know why. You don't know why. And you don't know if when's the winter going to end. <laughs> Do I need? You're going to take yeah. as many as you can. Yes. And now you have yes. these metaphysical invisible nuts that don't decay. And, and you're not like making the forest bare of fucking acorns if you're going to go and procure them. You're creating mm. abundance and all the physicality of the world because you can save in this metaphysical nature. Dude, all of the physical fully, stuff. Fully that people, yeah. Dude, all the physical stuff that people hold just because they have economic energy in them. You know, I, one of the, the last thing that I sold that had that I could say that without being extreme and selling things that I that I need and really going a little far on it was a truck. I had this Tacoma. It's a beautiful truck. It had suspension and nice camper shell. It's this timeless pickup truck that I liked, you know, but it's dilutive of my energy. I have to take care of it. I have to maintain it. And so letting go of that truck, I wouldn't have done it without Bitcoin. You know, it's a Toyota Tacoma. The resale value is pretty good on it. I used it sometimes. But hold on, wait a second. This thing is diluting my bandwidth. I got to register it. I got to wash it. I got to think about it. Yes, I need to get yes, rid of yes. it. And the act of doing so is putting more downward price pressure on used vehicles because I'm like, yo, I don't need a third car. It's my wife, myself. I have a truck. I don't need a second truck. So you sell the truck. This is taking place on mass scale and it's good for everybody. It, it's, yeah, it's a big deal, man. Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm enthralled. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm I'm hundred uh, percent aligned aligned with you. That freeing up that mental energy, that is exactly what it's about, right? That's also what I just mentioned.
as like if I'm home, I don't want to mitigate me losing my monetary energy by make by taking more risk, etc. Like I want to move the energy that I have to a system where it will accrue more value over time because everyone will be putting in their monetary energy or their their energy there. And that's why it frees up my mind. And then totally. I can move from consumerism to building. That's, well, you still that's have to the consume, sh- but you're doing so from a more calibrated, rational yeah, purpose, place. More purpose, more purpose, totally. more, more directed, basically, right? Yeah. Like, this is what I do need. This is what I don't need. Yeah. Um, well, another quote I loved was you said, stay humble, stay solvent, stack sets. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a variant of the OG, like stay humble, yeah. stack sets. Like stay solvent is a, that was a good addition, I think, like very important, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Why is the team of humility so common about amongst like people for who Bitcoin has clicked? Um, I think you have to be humble and open to the notion that what you believe to be true could be wrong. And I think that you have to be able to confront what was a cognitive bias and not experience cognitive dissonance. So the people who are more open to receiving new I- new ideology and new concepts are, I think, people who are generally less hubristic and convinced that they have it figured out and then in turn more predisposed to. I mean, see, the thing with Bitcoin is just it's so rational. It's so incredibly rational. I really do struggle with I don't understand why. You know, there's at, at first glance, if you think about it for 30 seconds, you're like, OK, this is a Ponzi. This is very interesting. But if you think about it for five minutes. Yeah, it's wild. It, it's like, OK, well, well, this thing is either they're either going to shut it down or it basically this changes everything, you know. And so, yeah, the people who are willing to go further than that, because then I think what happens, though, is people are like, they'll shut it down. And I actually don't think it's hubris. I think it's trauma. I think people are traumatized deeply. And as a result, they struggle to see it. Gabor Mate says, if you have a traumatizing experience, it creates a wound. It's a soft spot. And if you're talking about your life force, your energy, where for all of known history, a sociopath will just psychic take it from you in some capacity. We've evolved that now through this theft of debasement. But your that wound is a soft spot. So if you're talking about Bitcoin, who has a soft spot there and you develop scar tissue around that, they can't hear it. They're just like, you know what? No, mm-hmm. I, I, it's, you, what do you mean? That's something that's going to can't be taken and debased and it'll free us from all this shittiness. Like they're just like, no, but it makes it. a lot of sense because we always outsource that responsibility. Right. So it's, it's an easy initial thought to think like I have no power. Someone else will, you know, uh, use their power over me. So that's why this cannot probably be a thing. You know, that's easy cop out, easy yeah. program, programmed cop out, basically, yeah. right? Um, which is, I think, just a natural res- re- response. Um, but this is also why Bitcoin is difficult to grasp because once you think, like, no, I do have power, and I want that power, I want to be sovereign, then you are basically confronted with, you know, the second challenge which is okay but then you have to custody everything you own all your wealth yourself you cannot outsource this sovereignty anymore and then you're like oh damn okay this is another hump i have to get over right so i also see it as like it's all these little humps all these little humps where you have to think to yourself like okay do i want this no okay but then uh, i don't know like then i'm a slave or then i'm not in control or then i'm not a sovereign uh, person do i want that well, no. Okay, next problem, right? And it's like all these little, st- yeah, <laughs> little steps totally. until you end up at that place. Yeah. Um, so, if you if you would meet someone and they would say, you know, Eric, I see you talk about Bitcoin, but like, what is it, and why should I care? Like, what's your what's like the shortest orange pill pitch you have? I think I would go into right, and I do this actually. Essentially, the physicality of nature, the physicality of our reality, the metaphysical nature of Bitcoin and supply versus demand, the simple fundamental dynamics, infinite supply for whatever the monetary, the chosen monetary technology of a marketplace is, because money being convertible into any other good or service the marketplace can produce, you have infinite demand. 
And if you could create infinite scarcity and you could dematerialize it and then protect it by a wall of encrypted energy, you now create this essentially new monetary instrument within the marketplace that inverts the incentive structure, incentivizes peace, and also shows the two true deflationary productivity gains and advancements amongst the civilization and the populace, allowing those to flow to the productive class of our society. Um, and then I would just go over some basic and I do this too. Hey, you know, if you look at the last hundred years, like I what comes to mind is Sailor's PowerPoint presentation in Prague. The first one you use slides on when you put that out on the board and you just show these simple charts of like, look, the monetary debasement is this rate. Miami beachfront properties, this rate. Here's yeah, all yeah, the assets. Yeah, I love that classes. presentation. That's great. Dude, that yeah. was so good. And That's so you just the break one, it down. Actually, I'd say that, yeah. that that should be the one, right? Because he says it's like, so yeah, good. these are all the assets and then this yeah. is a Bitcoin. And An like, intellectually yeah. honest person cannot dispute that. 100%. Yeah. And so, yeah, I definitely have had the most orange pill success in, in with those topics. The metaphysical yeah. nature doesn't seem to be the most orange pilling, but it does actually <clears throat> with some of the people who, you know, I can end up in spiritual conversation with, you know, that I do have times where like, I've talked to somebody who doesn't know anything about Bitcoin. We're kind of talking about vibrational frequency and the spiritual element and the magicalness that we can kind of feel intuitively is in this realm mm. beyond. And when I speak to the emergence of the metaphysical and the physical, you know, like sailor says, Satoshi opened a portal. And now energy is flowing mm. into cyberspace. That seems to be thought provoking for people who are spiritually inclined. Uh, and then people who are monetarily incentivized, you just break down, look, let's get supply demand. Here's the, here's yep. the numbers. Yep. Nice. All right. Do you think wealth equates happiness? Mm, yes, but I don't measure wealth in monetary exclusively in monetary terms i think so bashar an entity channeled mm -hmm. by daryl ankin you could just say stream into consciousness yeah and I, I dig it i like what this guy says i like he it says too. yeah totally he says uh true abundance is your ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it so if you have the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it you have everything that you'll ever need and if mm. you have that, and then you build upon that a, I don't know, a moral base in how you interact and treat other people and, and pertains to you want other people to treat yourself that way, I think that very quickly you cultivate a reality for yourself that you would call, or at least I refer to as being, you know, wealthy. If you're wealthy, yeah. you're abundant. You're not only wealthy and abundant, monetarily speaking. You have to be abundant in love. You have to be abundant in opportunity and community. And, and I think that the, actually those are the things that are more important. You know, and what actually was really interesting for me that I've kind of just had to have grappled with slightly recently over the last, I would even say like six to eight weeks. You know, I've thought about like what happened if I lost my Bitcoin. Ooh. I'd be a little less comfortable, honestly, because money is stored energy, which gives you more optionality. You know, Breedlove says that it's a, it's a hedge against future uncertainty. I like that mm. description, but the strategy mm -hmm. doesn't change. Like I wouldn't go from being this excited video making weed smoking cannabis cultivator who's enthralled on Bitcoin in life to some depressed mop who's got to be dragged under from under the bridge because I've become an alcoholic and I can't function anymore because I lost everything and it wrecks my life. No, the strategy doesn't change. You just go to the marketplace, you do what you love, you treat the world around you like you want to be treated, you make arrangements, energy exchanges with people that you'd be happy to be on both sides of. You do the right thing. I think the right thing is the path of least resistance to getting the most because I'm ultimately lazy. Like I'm going to show up all the time as soon as I can, right? When I think I should be there, I don't negotiate with myself, you know? And so I think that that, yeah, that, that strategy, it's just... It doesn't change. And so with that, mm. life is now so exciting. And if you can see the inversion in the incentive structure, and then you could just watch the forces unfold, dude, it's beautiful. You know, it, yeah, it really is. I almost yeah. want to say it's also entertaining. Yes, it totally to see, is. To see if that's what you create in your mind can actually happen in the, 
yeah in the in the reality that you experience right um, yeah and so that pursuit today uh, i mentioned to you i was on a podcast of a dutch radio and and we they asked me like hey why did you start a podcast and i said well at one point i just figured out i'm gonna talk and think about this for the next 50 years with all these different people around the world totally. like i'm already doing so why why not start a podcast right and yeah. it's actually also a commitment in a sense in in a different way than what you just shared but to just what I envision in my head or like the thoughts that I have or the rationale that I go through when I think about Bitcoin, where when I end up by myself in a place, like I need to share that and, 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 and talk about that with others, but also be active on it to see if it will actually happen and how. Totally. Right? And then, then it feels like a real conscious journey towards a destination that we cannot even illustrate but that doesn't really matter right and i i think that's a really comforting um thought in a sense like a very conscious journey you follow and it doesn't really matter where you end up and that's yeah i think that's also for me what like wealth is in a sense that you are happy with the choice you make in a certain moment and totally okay with whatever the result is in a sense totally I hope that makes sense but yeah that's um yeah, I love that, man. I love that. Very cool. Yeah, and it's staying um, present. Yeah. You, you know, we only have now. It's only now, as far as we know. You know, it's got to be present. Yeah, so you give yourself a direction and a context. Yep. And yeah, you're, you you basically allow yourself to go there and see whatever happens, happens, or something like that. That, that also totally. gives you a lot of mental space, in a sense, I think. Yeah. All right, so last question that I ask everyone. What's a core belief that you will never let go? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, that we're eternal beings and that what you do in this life experience, I don't think you're absolved from when this life experience comes to an end. And you could say in some sense, I do, you, you could say I, I, I've, subscribe to the idea or believe in that like karmic lineage, that karmic loop. Mm -hmm. And yeah, what you do now you carry, I believe that it's, there's a common theme through our civilization. People intuitively know or believe that there's a difference between our physiology and our consciousness, our, our soul, yeah. if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we're doing here is super important it really is and i think that the sociopathic the plunder the game theoretic conundrum created by what i refer to as the old world causes people to behave in ways that intuitively i think even if they're unaware that the second and third order effects of their fiat wealth um acquisition strategy may have I think that those things permeate and vibrate into their soul in some sort of way. And I think that over time, what's so beautiful with Bitcoin is, is Bitcoin is going to release this monetary energy that's been stored up as a result of this shredding of our reality by confiscating life force from a poverty class and giving it to a wealth owning class, some of which are very ethical and market or productive in the marketplace. But I feel like there's an energetic funk if you will that's tied up in that and as that monetary energy leaves a corrupt system a broken reality i can make all all the analogies and tie it moves into this new system this new reality this new world with a new incentive structure the ethical network metaphysical property the, the sheer magic that bitcoin is i think it transmutes that energy and i think it absolves us of some of the karmic funk that we have as a result, you know, as I'm, I'm in America and I have lived a, um, a lavish life relative to the rest of the world as a result of the exportation of our monetary technology and getting goods and services from the rest of the world as a result. And so I think that you will pay the price in life. There's no getting around that. I think it's just sheer physics. And I do believe that there's this very magical and interesting thing that's taking place on a physiological and a metaphysical level in our reality 
as a result of Bitcoin. I think it's transmuting these bad vibes, this weird funk. I think it's transmuting ancestral trauma. It's lowering cortisol levels. It's it's causing people to be happier about a reality that I think intuitively most people struggled with. It was kind of, you know, we it's it's the ultimate form of hope as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, that's what I think. I think that uh, we're eternal beings. And I think that we take we take from this experience into the beyond and into whatever experience comes after that. We're just moving through time space. Dude, I love yep. that, man. That's the longest answer I've had to this question to date, but Dude. I absolutely love it. I want to I want to follow up a bit like because you said, you know, it 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 hel Bitcoin helps us get in a higher state of consciousness. If you say we are eternal beings, do you like do you believe in reincarnation? Uh, yeah, I would say that I look at it in terms of like, so you could say yes, in the way that I like to frame it. And maybe this mm -hmm. is just part of being a millennial. But I liken it's like you and I could be sitting on a couch in a, in a another reality, another dimension, and we chose to live this life and play this video game. It's PlayStation 21 million. And here we are playing <laughs> yeah. the the planet earth find Bitcoin game and you have to go through life and find Bitcoin. And as you do, then you get to level two and now you're playing a new level and then maybe you'll ascend to level three. Maybe you die on level two and you go back to the couch and you're like, whoa, that was a trip. And then let's play again, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. the way I, I, I think about it. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That was how my mind went to, I, I believe that as you said, you know, there's a difference between, the soul and the physical body, right? And so the goal of the soul for each life is to transcend the body, right? You have to transcend and ascend yep. to escape the, the physical life. And if you are not able to do that within your physical life, then you reincarnate. But if you can enlighten yourself within the time space of your physical life, Yep. Then you go to the eternal life, you know, of the of, the, of the, the next eternal, level. eternal being, as you just said, right? Yeah. And I think if I connect that to what we just talked about, if the base layer of value exchange or information exchange between people that we use to create value in the physical, you know, space time reality that we live in, if we can make that an engineered truth and therefore free up mental space that we can use to build more together. We will also have more mental space to transcend the mind, you know, yep. within our uh, meat, meat space <laughs> life, yeah. basically. Uh, yeah, that's kind of how I translate what you just said. Yeah, I love that, man. Like, uh, I, I, I could talk way, long, way longer about this. I think yeah. uh, it's super fun and and a nice, you know challenge to you know for your for your for your mind uh, really totally. so i hope people who listen to this uh were able to follow us or else we just had a a nice conversation uh yeah <laughs> if i could say um so yeah man that was my last question i i'd love to wrap up i will link to your x account so people can see your awesome videos and uh yeah man i want to thank you so much for for coming on i really enjoyed this yeah me too man i'm super grateful really appreciate you Thanks. I'm grateful too, man. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Cool, man. Well, be in touch. Cheers. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.